So, 200 subscribers. Thank you so much. It's very nice that uh, I think three weeks ago, January 9th, we were sitting here discussing you and thanking you for 100 subscribers. And then in three additional weeks, or a little bit more, but less than one month, we have doubled that. So thank you so much. And uh, I really hope that uh, you keep enjoying the content that we try to provide for you. 200! So here we do a subscriber special. This is for Jack Finch, who asked me uh, nine things, and I will introduce them. It's, it will handle ownership of a petadil, the type of owner for petadils. So sorry, now we have two. <laughs> Why to choose a petadil over other breeds? The inspiration that one could have for such a breed. The types of petadil and why you could have one or the other. And the top 10, ten things you should uh, recommend if someone gets a petadil terrier. Interesting facts about the breed. And it, the, ten, no, the 10 things you should know before getting a petadil. I, I see a team of 10 there coming now, Jack. <laughs> and 9 the exercise needs. So we will start with that. So first point, what's it like owning a petadil? Owning a petadil is owning quite a small type of dog, but it doesn't feel like that. It's like an espresso, you have the, the full coffee experience uh, of a normal regular cup of coffee, but then you have an espresso. And if you take an espresso and only put so much water in it and double the espresso amount of coffee, then you get the ID. So it's maximum dog in a minimum package. That's a good uh, explanation in my opinion. And uh, the, the funny thing is that uh, the dog also feels like that himself. So he doesn't look at himself as being a small dog. He won't back down for nothing. And that's a really interesting feature. It also translates to how I am as a person. So I hope this helps. What type of owner should own a petadil? That's the second question. Now Jack, in my opinion, should be one, an active uh, owner so that you can give the dog proper exercise and also stimulation of the mind. Two, you should not be uh, afraid because this that little uh, uh, petadil dog that you have has a big attitude. So you should be wary of that. Also with involving cats, other dogs or the like. So you should be prepared to know that you have a little firecracker. You should also, in my opinion, uh, preferably keep the petadils in house. They are different than, for example, German Yacht Terrier, which is also an elite hunting terrier that I would always recommend keep outside because it is such a neurotic um, breed in, a, in general sense. It's better to keep them outside. But a petadil is a very much a bull and terrier character type of dog and loves to be kept inside with its family. Another point is that the type of owner of a petadil should uh, know that there are limits. Of course, you can keep them with other animals, but be wary that they have a strong hunting instinct and especially with uh, rodents, uh, cats and uh, the likes. Also rabbits, I would never recommend it. With ferrets, also keep a close supervision. You can break them off, <laughs> but it's not an easy task and it's not that it will always be going great if you're not around. And also that, eh? sometimes you can teach your petadil, for example, to leave other uh, creatures alone as long as you're there. But if you're not there, it could be completely different. So also, be uh, able to separate them. And the other thing is that it should be an owner that really enjoys the temperament of a petadil terrier. The next question is why to choose a petadil and uh, why? This is a personal opinion. Eh? For me personally, 
um, from I came from a bull and terrier background. I had an Irish Staffordshire bull terrier before. I'm a perfect dog, perfect family dog. The only thing is that um, his strength was so uh, great that it would be hard for, for example, a child to walk him. Also for my wife, he was. Uh, yeah, in, in very good fit form, I think 90 kilogram, 90.5 perhaps, but could also, and still packing a lot of uh, not being fat, well over 20 kilograms, 23, 24, easily, and that's uh, immense power. You cannot imagine if you never had a bull and terrier, what 23 or 24 kilograms of bull and terrier does to uh, a small female or child, if it uh, is going to... Um, Pull the leash in full force. And there's another thing. The Irish Hampshire Bull Terrier is a perfect family dog. Very people friendly, in my opinion. But also, uh, there are two things that are quite negative. One is the stigma that you could have with a uh, pit bull type of dog. That they, the general public will claim it be. It is. And the, the other thing is that um, yeah, I already mentioned the, the strength. So I'm not going into that. Because it can also be a benefit. But the other thing is that um, the size makes it a lot easier. So not only that uh, you don't have that stigma of a pitbull type of dog with a smaller dog. But also it's very easy to, to keep at the foot end in your car. You can also keep it in a smaller crate if you have to uh, travel. So you have quite a lot of benefits. There are also uh, other factors to be involved here for me i like the bull and terrier beats being very big or being very small like a petadil so that's on me for me on the same sliding uh, um, scale and with a smaller dog you can do a lot of a lot more things an important factor is uh, next to the size yeah, we discussed uh, the stigma the size it could be beneficial but a more important factor is that they are far less dog aggressive so the Pet Hill Terrier has a hunting uh, terrier background, whereas the Irish Staffordshire Bull Terrier has more of a pit background. So that's different. And that would be the, the biggest uh, things to consider, in my personal opinion. Also, uh, important to a certain degree as well, um, Pet Hill Terriers are a healthy breed. Very healthy, in my opinion. Even healthier than uh, Irish Staffordshire Bull Terriers. And they also are being worked very hard. For example, the, the father of uh, my dog is now 11 years old. And has, been, and has still been uh, worked every, every uh, one of those years. So that gives you some uh, examples. Also on the robustness of the breed. And to the times they are tested and to see if they are yeah, worth their uh, feet, so to say. Next question is, what inspired you about the breed? Yeah, inspired is a little bit big. As I mentioned, I always uh, liked the Bull and Terrier breed. Before that, I liked uh, natural dogs, more the wolf-like dogs, uh, a lot. And I also like that they have that natural ambience and they uh, also have uh, nice uh, uh, features. But in practice, they are not that uh, beneficial. One, wolf-like dogs are not that nice in temperament. As you compare them, for example, with Bull and Terrier breeds, they bark, howl, dig up, they try to escape. <laughs> That's all types that Terriers can also do. But if you have a Bull and Terrier, they are a lot more relaxed. Also, they are not howling. They don't bark as much. Bull and Terrier type of dogs are uh, strong dogs. So silent, strong type. That I liked. The fur of a... Uh, of a polar dog is a lot, uh, yeah, a lot more uh, time consuming. So you have to take care of it. It gets uh, dirty. You have to uh, the the undercoat will blow. All types of uh, things that I don't like. Third, I like a lot with uh, this uh, short coated uh, dogs that they have a very good uh, ability to exchange heat. Also, there's a benefit that you can see the musculature a lot better. And then the most important part, the character of a Bull and Terrier is a completely different than natural type of uh, dogs. They are very brave. They don't back down. 
they um, they will go to fire for you to hell that is sometimes I say but I don't believe in that but they will yeah will really put it down and uh, that's very nice also extremely friendly on ge in general uh, to uh, humans that's a good thing if you have children for example if you have an Akita uh, with that uh, uh, character it is for a lot more protective also if children will interact that Akita might pick a side and attack the other kid remember that if you have for example a shepherd type of do dog it can also be very dangerous for your children if you're not there to uh, let the dog know that the child is above it because the dog wants to go higher in the hierarchy with bull and terrier breeds this is uh, very often not the case which i really like also they have like an on button when they are outside and you, you keep them exercising and also an off button they can be very relaxed as well not always that hyper i will try and add a little bit about the inspiration part for me uh, the gladiator type of dog or a dog that is willing to face uh, a strong adversary without backing down is very inspiring uh, being at it at uh, an original bulldog dealing with a bull that's so much bigger the bull and terrier breeds that fought even against lions and bears it's all blood sports and in shadow of course and but they have so much bravery and also the petadil terrier for example facing a badger in his den uh, foxes uh, very big rats like nutria even hawks yeah. and if you talk about hawks you can also expand it a little bit to the extremely big bull and terrier breeds in my opinion such as Sedogo Argentino that faces uh, hawks, swines and also puma, cougar, mountain lion other words for that very brave type of dogs so that I like as well then the next question why you wanted your type of petadil and would you recommend it uh, my type of petadil uh, that is a little bit different it's not my type there are certain breeders that um, breed a certain type of petadil some being very small that they could go into the hole of a groundhog for example some being quite big that they can manage uh, bigger quarries such as uh, european badger or raccoons or uh, the, the hawks and swines that i refer to for me i like my dog a little bit bigger therefore it's more robust also if it's, it gets into an interaction with another dog that tries to attack it for example a very small dog can easily be killed by a bigger dog being the size of a german shepherd for example that's one also i like the bigger dog because they are more robust also if you for example fall upon your dog in an accident they will be less likely to break something and i like to have a dog on the chain I like my dogs if it's a bull and terrier between 10 and 15 kilograms that's i think my optimum uh, skill for a different type of dog you will need more kilograms uh, to have the same power there so that's uh, a point you have the size uh, component another important component would be there are different types of petadils and uh, regardless of the size you also have more of the baying type so more of a barking type that's not uh, very known in the petadil most are more of a mix type so they bay and uh, the catch or being a catch dog so baying type will kill uh, animals that are easy to be killed if it's an animal that's quite strong it will bay and keep keep the quarry busy uh, and not try to fully engage and the mix type can do both eh? so the baying but also the catch dog depending on the situation and then you have the catch dog type that even faces uh, the quarry, even if it's a lot stronger, for example, a petadil versus a swine, a hawk, a badger, a badger is also a lot stronger than a dog normally. So that gives you a little bit of insight. And I'm more at the baying side. No, 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 the catch dog uh, side. So as far as possible away from the baying side. So more to the catch dog side. And I like that type because it's more brave in my opinion, but also uh, they are far less barky. So you have the most silent, strong uh, type at this <laughs> side of the range. Also with that you have different, uh, I mentioned other character, but also you have different types. You have types with a very smart snipey head, often those are more the baying types. You have types that have a very strong head and those are more the uh, strong dog, catch dog type. 
and I'm also more on the, the stronger uh, type, not exaggerated, very able, very athletic, but a strong uh, head and strong uh, neck and paws, not uh, very brittle. Would I recommend it? It all depends on what you want. If you want a doctor that's very alert and uh, will, will give you um, give you everything there is, then a baying type could be better. If you're a hunter, a mixed type could be the best bet because then you still have the catch dog ability, but you also have the ability to have it uh, less damage. Because if you have a catch dog all the time, the dog will have a lot of uh, injuries as well. You will be uh, getting to the quarry. The quarry will not have a big chance of escaping, of course, but the dog will suffer. Also a lot of injuries if you have a baying type, of course, then you uh, will have the least uh, amount of injuries, but then you might be losing out on the catch dog and the mix that could be a good compromise uh, within. So it all depends on what you want. For me, I like a silent dog and uh, of a certain size because the reason I recommend, but it could be completely different for you. Uh, the next question is the top 10, I would, top 10 things I would recommend if you get a petadome. Yeah, I don't know if I uh, will make it to 10. I will only uh, do so if I have good reasons. So I'm not going to make it to 10 if it's not there. But first, you should be uh, have, a <laughs> have the opportunity to care for the petadil. Eh? So give it the exercise, walk it uh, daily. So you should have uh, some shoots that you can walk on. But also, if, even if you have to do it barefoot, it doesn't matter as long as the dog gets its uh, exercise. Two, in my opinion, should they get a good color? So I would recommend a white color. White color puts a little bit less stress on the neck, or you could have a harness, but I like to have a good color as well as a main attribute. The additional benefit of a white color is that you protect the veins in the and the arteries in the neck a little bit better if another dog tries to bite it, and that's oftentimes the main cause of uh, bleeding to death or being the ribs and uh, stomach being crushed or ripped open. The other thing I would recommend is to get a breaking stick. And why? Uh, if your uh, terrier is reluctant to let loose, sometimes they do, it's good that you have an option to quickly separate them. So I would recommend to, to have that. When you start to have a pup, I would recommend to have a crate to, uh, this will help to make it, uh, yeah, make it less uh, messy, so that it will learn that this is this is his place, and also that will help to um, limit the times that it will be able to soil the place if they are not uh, yet bro housebroken. Another benefit of the crate is that you can put it away if you if the dog is too hyper or something or someone brings another pet or whatever and you can just put it away somewhere that it is not able to see the pet but also not able to reach those other people. Another thing that I would recommend is a police line. This is a type of line that you can attach for example to the collar or the harness and that you can adjust on different ways so it has different rings where you can place the you know, or can reconfigure the line in. It's not a must-have, but it uh, could be handy. I would also recommend that you get good food boils and uh, and water bowls. I uh, use stainless steel myself because I think that's the best way to do it. But it can help that you keep uh, things uh, tidy. Um, then you have like six things already. I will, good chewing toys to give them a good exercise. I would recommend a Kong or a Nyla bone that are good toys. They are very sturdy. Kong ball is also a very nice thing to have, so some toys could help. And uh, yeah, I will make it to seven, but there, those are seven good points, I think. So the top 10 interesting um, facts about the breeds. Again, I don't know if I will make it to the top 10. I will try uh, to give you some good insights that really are interesting, instead of just spoiling and, and uh, rambling on. The first very interesting thing about the Petadol Terrier is that the chest of the Petadol Terrier can collapse a little bit more than that of an other type of breed. So what does that mean? The dog can go through smaller crevices because it can compress his chest to a higher degree. That's an interesting fact. Second interesting fact is that for the uh, chest size of a Petadol Terrier, you will be hard pressed to find a heavier dog. And how is that? Petal terriers are limited by chest size eh, to chase a quarry. 
and they have very strong bones for their uh, chest size and also very good muscles so that gives you quite a heavy dog for the chest size that they have this chest circumference another thing is they have a very sturdy uh, skin the skin is uh, as thick or thicker than that of for example uh, a dog uh, two or three times its uh, size for example the other bull terrier that had the Irish Hampshire bull terrier had a comparably thick, sk thick skin a fourth thing is that they have a very thick uh, coat as well so my type of uh, petrodeal has a smooth coat which I recommend uh, for, my, for my personal taste there also are rough coat and broken coats and those could be better if they are, uh, have a terrain that is more demanding but even then the implants of the hairs are that tight that it's very uh, hard for sand and other stuff to get in and that's very easy to clean another thing is uh, that people often not, do not know that the bravery of a petrodeal is uh, I think the highest or one of the highest of any dog breed the only other dog breed that could um, be as brave or even braver is American Pitbull Terrier of game lines so I make it to a top five but those are five really really good things about the Petrodeal in my opinion so another request of a top 10 list of uh, things you should know before getting a Petrodeal Again, I'm not going to make it to 10 if I don't have uh, something valid to say. One you should know, a petrodeal terrier is a working breed, a hunting breed. So they will, the task is to chase and especially uh, also engage other creatures, very oftentimes uh, being able to kill them. So that's the point. Another point that you should know that they are extremely brave and extremely capable for their size. Another point is that a working breed should get ample exercise and you should know that. If you cannot give that to them, being both physically but also mentally, you should have to give them something to work around, work with and also to keep their mind occupied, you should not get a better deal. Also, all, um, all breeds of dogs can be quarrelsome among each other, but especially uh, same-sex uh, aggression is quite often the case, regardless of the breed. But the Petterdale or other terriers are often a lot more feisty. So that means if they will engage, they will engage uh, yeah, seriously. They will try to do whatever they can. And that's with everything that they attempt. Another thing is a Petterdale or another terrier type of dog is not a dog that normally will follow you like a slave. They have their own minds because they had to engage and to work in the dance on their own. And they do that very good. So please do not expect that from your dog so I think I have now five things and those are uh, very important to consider just leave it at that exercise needs that was the last uh, question in my opinion you should uh, give a working breed ample exercise if you do not it will be destructive or also around the house and yeah you just will be uh, tormenting the breed so if you're not able to give it ample exercise, please do not consider a working breed, let alone a petrodeal terrier, which is an elite working breed. So the exercise needs are, to keep it simple, you can uh, build it up to an extreme level, of course, and they will still be able to manage. But the minimum would be that you just walk it like three to four times a day and also give it a mental exercise. And if you walk it for a good period of time, this is also helping you a lot because the dog will be a lot more relaxed in-house. Exercise needs also that they want to have something to, to work with. So something to chew on, they really like as well. Also something to, uh, to play tug of war with, they really like that. If you can give them something to hunt, that's even better. Of course, that's the, the primary purpose of this breed. That, that would be really a good exercise. But also if you give give it exercise and you let it loose, be wary that they might be chasing another animal or a blood trail. Also that they might enter a hole and get stuck or die there. And how do you get your dog out if you don't have a shovel with you? Please keep this in mind also with exercising your dog. And also look out that you don't have same uh, sex dogs that are yeah, just uh, being the macho around each other. And perhaps getting into a fight 
So, um, also things that you could consider there are like uh, sled mills that could help. They should not um, um, be instead of the normal walks because also the dogs needs to have the normal expression and the, the smells and other things uh, and the interaction with nature a lot. And also has to relieve itself from its uh, urine and also uh, excrements, of course. But you could, if you want to add a little bit more of exercise, a sled mill is a very good way to uh, do this. You can also have this with uh, free running a sled so that the dog has a good uh, run. Another thing that could be very good is you can exercise it by uh, walking it, you can jog with it, you can um, bicycle with it. But please keep in mind that if the dog has to relieve itself, it might break very hard and you will scrape the footpads. But another thing is that you, you could play tug of war, you can uh, ball games they really like because they have a high prey drive. Um, you can also have, for example, uh, dogs doing uh, agility if you really would like to, or chasing an uh, artificial uh, quarry around the track. They will not be the faster dog because they're quite heavy for their uh, chest, but they are very fast as compared to your average uh, pet breed. So even a dog like a flat coated retriever with a very athletic build or a border collie, even from working lines, I've seen my dogs out uh, accelerate them. I think the top end after a while will be not as high because they, they lack the ball length, but they're very fast, even though they are quite heavy for their size. So that was it. Some people of you are runners, so long distance runners or short distance runners, joggers or the likes. And how cool, cool would it be if you could save 70% of time or run 70% faster? Same you. Same track, okay. the only difference would be that you uh, have a dog together with you that accompanies you and is also your running buddy and pulls you to a certain degree. This is called Canicos and what you need for it is quite easy. In its essence you need a dog like yourself of course, but the best way to approach is that the dog is in a harness so that not all the stress is put on its neck by pulling you and also that you are yourself uh, are in a harness and in that harness you uh, will also put a lot less stress on your arms because if I would run like this and I also did this quite, a, quite some times and you can also test it out just on the leash eh, with you holding it but then your arm movement is a little bit more restricted Whereas if you have a harness that's uh, at your belly or hip level, that helps a lot, also puts uh, the center of gravity a little bit uh, lower. But 70% faster. And there's a YouTube video, I will also make some screenshots of it, to show you where you can find it. And that uh, did two, uh, two times the same track, and was able to have over 70% increase in uh, speed which is tr tremendous in my opinion there was already an athlete that was able to have a good uh, good running speed and was now a lot better and this is a fun way also for your dog of course to get it in the exercise modus also for yourself it's good to build on your stamina and uh, keep your cardiovascular system working and I just wanted to uh, share it with you hope you like it and uh, look at the pictures to see uh, see the complete uh, mission have a great day bye bye So in this video we will discuss uh, Canicross and how do I know that it works. In an earlier video I showed uh, details of another YouTuber who already uh, saw 70.4% increase in speed uh, by jogging the same track 
without and after that with the dog. So a kind of cross the dog uh, helps you uh, helps you uh, to cover the distance uh, faster because it gives you some pull. But also, I mean, I uh, I found this out by just walking my own dog. And when I walk the dog with my wife and I have the dog, and the dog is pulling like he is now, she has a hard time of keeping up, even harder than normally walking next to each other. But when I give her the line, she walks the same speed as I without, as I do without the line. So it gives you some insight. If the line is reduced by me at the pulling motion and it's given to her, you see a big difference. So it is also an easy trick that you could do if you have a dog that is pulling to see uh, how much uh, more speed that uh, gives you. Or you could walk up the street and down the street and just time it and see how it, how it goes. Another thing about uh, candy cross I will put down in the next video. So candy cross is often referred to as jogging with your dog and uh, just a, a good thing eh, because it gives you good condition for yourself but also for the dog. It also keeps the nails down eh, that the dog is allowed to pull. And there's something else that is uh, there because you can cover terrain much faster than you would jogging yourself. So it's also very effective for both you and the dog. But there's another thing. Sometimes they also have uh, carnival cross uh, competitions, and then they oftentimes also do it like a little bit like a Viking run. So uh, they have obstacles that you have to mitigate together. Of course, it's far less uh, based on power because they want to be all inclusive. Not all dogs have that much power, but sometimes they even have something that the dog has to pull on, a, yeah, like a tug of war. Uh, a tug of war uh, court and uh, work together with the boss but also to cover terrain very fast sometimes they have to do uh, a little bit of swimming together or uh, you can also swim in this rainy weather eh? it's really <laughs> rainy cats and dogs now but also uh, a canoe together or something i think it's a very nice uh, thing you should not take it too uh, seriously but it's a good thing to do together and also a nice thing. Um, depends a little bit on what kind of breed you have about giving you the edge. Yeah? Of course, this is a very small dog, so it will be easily lifted. That would be a benefit. If you have to uh, mitigate terrain and your dog is not allowed to or not able to uh, jump over it, it will be a lot of easier to lift this type of dog than, for example, uh, the Malinois. But also, very often your dog is able to mitigate those, uh, those, yeah, you can call it uh, yeah. a walk example, or uh, another thing that's hindering your pet and you just have to mitigate. So, I would not opt for too small a dog. I do have a smaller dog, like you see here, but I think in Candy Cross there are better choices. Why? The bigger the dog. So the bigger the dog is, the harder it will be when the dog breaks. And uh, to relieve itself, for example, when uh, yeah, he, he has to relieve himself from some excrements or some urine, even during the run, because of the cold water or something else. Even though you prepped before, you will not make it that way. Spiky. And also I would, yeah, rather advise to get a, a smooth coated variety with a thick coat. And why? You see it's very easy to clean. Also the water uh, gets off quite easily. Still offers good protection. You see, now I can only, only use this uh, towel and he's already cleaned. And also will help a lot with the, the heat. Yeah. So if a dog stays uh, stays wet for a long time, this is not a good thing. Water resistant, fat layer could also be helpful. 
but it would be detrimental again if it's very hot. So it depends a lot on what you want. Hope this helps. The dog here is my petadil, one and a half years old. Estacado. Spiky. He's a good boy. Only 12 kilograms and a little bit. I just brought the kids to their mother. And I want to, uh, in this founder in car series, I also want to tell you how you can teach your children entrepreneurship in a playful manner. And uh, of course you could do the Castro Quadrant, but it's a little bit um, higher in the, the concept phase that you have to uh, think about. Whereas there's a very accessible, easier alternative that can also show the children the essentials, and that's called Monopoly. So the essential that you want to uh, transfer to your children is that there's one thing, a rat race, and you have to escape that rat race. And uh, of course, in the Castro Quadrant uh, game by Kiyosaki, this essential of the game, whereas in Monopoly, it's often that you have to, to win and to beat all the other players by yeah, having the most uh, assets and also especially if the other players are not able to pay you anymore. Okay, to just start with Monopoly. Normally you have a, a board and once you uh, pass an entire round you get 200 euros for example in our edition. But you could have another edition, it doesn't matter that much. But you get a certain amount for each round. But there are also uh, risks, yeah? for example uh, there are uh, um, places on the map, the card, the board, so to say, where you have to pay 200 euros as taxes or no, another pay 100. You have chance and uh, more of a um, general uh, uh, cards that you can pick and it can also uh, give you money but also uh, mean that you have to pay or you get taxed or something like that. So. Normally with a normal job also you, you work your 8 hours, you get your pay, but also there are some risks and some uh, standard costs that you have to uh, pay. Whereas your environment is changing all the time, for example your rent is getting higher, etc. Costs of living are also getting higher, so how to cope with that? Like the cash flow quadrant you have to have some side hustles and the monopoly you have to buy assets. For example, you have a lot of streets that you can buy, but they're also like stations or uh, uh, yeah, more of uh, electric, uh, um, electric and uh, and water uh, solutions. For example, that can also give you. So those electricity and water, they're only two, and if you get them both, you get ten times the dice that are um, that you throw the opponent throws when they hit those uh, spots and if you only have one you get four times then you have that, uh, those uh, uh, stations or uh, flight commercials and then you get uh, 25 if you have one on each of them 50 if you have two and uh, 100 if you have three so it's, it's doubled every time and if you have all four you get the 200 when they come on each of those things and those are quite accessible because you don't need to invest that much and you don't have to build houses and uh, hotels on them. But they still give a, a good a proper cash flow. And this is especially important because there are two cards and those cards prompt you to pay taxes for each house that you build and each hotel that you build as well. And the thing is, the biggest lesson in my opinion that a Monopoly can teach your children is that even if something is uh, costly or uh, not paying that much uh, dividend yet, if you are able to buy it, you should often just take it. And that's also what uh, in real life, if there are assets that you can acquire, if possible, please acquire them. And why? Because if you don't acquire them, you don't get those uh, returns. Also, if you have a street, of course you can build houses and uh, a total street and hotels, but also the normal uh, rent is doubled already, instead of if you only have one. And if you have, 
for example, one of uh, one of those uh, bigger streets, and you have only one of the three, you can still bargain with, for example, another player and to make it happen. And that can be uh, very worthwhile to you. And if you do so, then uh, you have access to your assets, and your assets will also pay the bills that you have to pay on other players and perhaps you will win but the mindset uh, to just act upon uh, the opportunities that's the most important lesson and of course it cannot uh, tip its head to the cash flow quadrant for the complete uh, overview especially if you want to go in real estate or something like that but I think it's a very accessible entry also for children and they like it and be aware that if something is accessible you can easier uh, play it with a bigger group you can also easier play it without uh, children or yourself thinking how, how much do I have to invest in just understanding the concept especially if your children are young this is an uh, important uh, thing to address well I hope you like this video have a great day and uh, keep on hustling bye bye So another foundering car and today we are going to talk about the ABC. So the ABC you think, what does that mean? Is this uh, just uh, me getting to know grammar or uh, the letters of the alphabet? No, it's not that. ABC stands for always be closing and uh, what that means is if you are able as an entrepreneur to close a deal as you want it to be closed, stop and just close the deal and then direct your attention to something else. So this, is, this has two benefits. One is you don't have to put more energy in this uh, deal and you can move forward to another deal. That's one. And the second one is if the deal is already at the level that you want it to be, Normally it can only get, so it's here, it can only get worse. So stop talking and just sign the deal. And in my opinion, many people think that uh, the best background for being an entrepreneur is that you have, for example, a master in business administration or an economic degree. And of course those uh, degrees can help, but in my personal opinion also uh, a sales background is very helpful and could be even more helpful and why is that because when you are in sales you know what uh, drives people you sell them a dream you know to how to interact on their needs and also uh, and also know um, how to manage people and direct them directly at their needs so you don't come up with a technical story especially especially an over technical story but you just address their needs and by so by doing so you can of course stress those points that are needed and there's could be technical points sometimes but more often than not they are addressed at the why, why it would be good to have it, so what's in it for them. And that is an important lesson, not only when you're selling your product, but also when you're interacting with uh, potential partners, where you go there and, and, and uh, try to uh, raise money for your business, or you are negotiating with uh, money lenders, or when you're looking for um, some uh, financing through subsidies or something like that. You know what that party wants and you address that needs. And also if you develop a product, of course the technical part can be very important, but develop something with a need in mind. So for example I'm in the medical branch, then you have an unmet medical need, so a need that is there and is not being met currently and then you offer a solution to that problem. 
instead of offering an, an additional technical uh, advancement to the palette of technical advancement that they already have. You just offer a solution to a problem and the bigger the problem is, the more important the solution becomes and it also helps you to um, yeah, get attention but also traction for your solution and in this case your solution is your product so I hope uh, this helped you and uh, I'm very interested in your thoughts have a great day bye bye so we're just hitting a roundabout and the benefit of a roundabout is that uh, you can keep moving and it is also so in uh, entrepreneurship if there is a problem Sometimes in, indeed you have to go through the problem, or over the problem, or under the problem. But sometimes you can also go around the problem. And when you're able to go around the problem, the benefit is you can keep on moving. So, because you are able to keep moving, you keep inertia. You keep moving forward with your business. And you learn additional lessons because you also know how to uh, mitigate uh, these kind of problems in the future. And perhaps you learn of routes that you didn't know of before. And even when the problem is gone, perhaps some of those routes are still interesting to you. And if they are, you just learn something. It has a uh, universal application. So, I would always advise, if it's possible, explore the option of going around the problem. Because, especially as a starting uh, entrepreneur, it's very hard to break the mold. Uh, and if you just work with the system, you often are better off. I like the product to be disruptive, uh, that to have a solution that is completely new and addressing an, uh, a need that is there in the market. But don't try to uh, divert your energy and attention to all types of things that are not that uh, important because as a small party you will be very hard pressed to change those things even as a big party it will be very hard to change everything well i hope you like this uh, short lesson and i wish you all the best bye bye in today's episode of founder and car we will discuss the investor and especially what the investor uh, wants to find in your company. And there are three things that are of importance to them. One is, of course, your business plan, your ID. Two is the financial situation that you uh, are in, so well, that you had in the past, and also the forecast of your future. And of course, what kind of money do you want? And third is the team. So what, what are the individuals that make up the core team? So starting from the first, most persons think that this is the most important uh, factor, but I do not agree with that. So that's the business model, the idea that you have, that you want to take into the market and make money with. This is often the, the brainchild of uh, one of the founders, what could also be an acquisition that they made on a strategic level. This is also important because an investor wants to know how you can make money and also what are your um, core products strengths but also weaknesses. So within a company they look at strength, weaknesses, opportunities and threats of course. But also on the, your business model, how that uh, compares to the competition, for example, what are the benefits, but also what are the drawbacks of the business model that you try to uh, pursue. And in biotech, medtech, they also want to know if you have unique selling points. So these are points that you can um, deviate from the competition. Yeah, what makes your product unique? What are the 
need say address that other that other products are not able to address. <coughs> Sorry. So that being said, I want to keep this uh, version uh, snappy and short. So I will uh, go back to, or go back to the second point that I mentioned. Uh, the financials they want to know if the amount of money that you are asking is within the scope of uh, the investor so oftentimes a company has a scope of what kind of money they want to raise but also an investor has a scope how much money they put in each uh, investment opportunity and they also want to see how this relates to the amount of shares for example that they can receive yeah? so the valuation also of your company so how much is it worth at this time and, uh, and for doing that they often look at the total financial package that you have so not only the, the sales that you made up till now or the development paths and the, the steps that you made and how much is still needed to get to the point that you want to go but also the forecasts eh? if they invest what are you able to do with that money and also what are you able to do without their money and this is a, a critical path because uh, oftentimes this is neglected by uh, many companies to display this in a proper way and therefore it costs uh, investors a lot more time to, uh, to get to know the company also on the financial level and oftentimes also if they see that the financials are not uh, up to speed they will be quite reluctant um, to invest. Also with the financials comes uh, not only the potential but also the risk. And oftentimes investors like as little uh, risk as possible and as much um, upside as possible. So the potential should be high but also the risk they often like uh, to be uh, containable so to say. Often, of course, if there is more risk, there can also be more upside. So you have some high-risk investors. But even those, in my uh, personal experience, are often very uh, wary of high-risk opportunities and are looking for things to minimize their risk. Okay, third. In my opinion, this is the most important uh, factor of the team. So not only the ID but and the financials but also the team is very important. And why? For example, starting with the first, if you have uh, an ID that doesn't work out or the competition is closing in on you or even completely uh, overshadows you at a certain uh, time point, if you have a good team, you're still able to mitigate and to search for uh, niches that you can still operate in and also look at uh, other opportunities to explore which are not already met. So a good team helps to uh, complete each other, so you have a diverse uh, set and also they have a baseline level that they can easily understand each other. And they are loyal and they are hard working and uh, also with a sharp mind. Because you can be loyal and hard working, but if you don't have a sharp mind, it will be very hard to, um, yeah, to really make it uh, work. And also if you're not loyal, what good is your uh, sharp mind and hard work if you will step uh, to the competition, for example, whenever you can. And also it's good that you have a team that is, um, has a, a good mix of friendship, that they uh, yeah, really stick together and help each other but also they keep each other sharp. So, also as the Bible says, uh, iron sharpens iron. So, if you have um, similar uh, sharp minds, also with another expertise, they are able to, to keep the entire team sharp. So this is an important uh, factor. Well, I hope you liked this short video. I give you an introduction of uh, what is uh, important to an investor, the three steps. Uh, one, the business model, the idea that you want to pursue, or the product that you already have, to the financial situation, so including the financial situation in the past, 
but also the forecast and the risk associated. Also keep in mind the scope. Eh? How much money do you want to raise and how much money do are they uh, yeah, willing to invest and third the team. Because the team, teamwork is dream work and the team completes everything. If you have a bad team, also an investor has to cut out the team and that will be uh, very hard. Why would they invest in something that doesn't work and people that they don't trust and get, are not able to uh, mitigate also problems. Have a great day. Take care. So it's now raining and uh, we can discuss a rainy day fund. So this is uh, an original um, concept that was there for entrepreneurs, especially those that were uh, farmers. Because if it's raining it's quite hard to work and you are not able to get uh, as much done as you should or want to do. And because you are not able to do so, because if the rain is pouring, it's very hard to work the field. Also, you can uh, get losses of crops that can be devastated by hard rain, especially if it also contains, for example, hail. And then you need to have some grain or other things in stock so you can come through this period. A similar concept can be there if there's drought. Eh? If there is no uh, rain coming in, it's only uh, dry times, also the harvest can uh, be postponed or completely eliminated because you're not able to uh, make your crops grow or something else. So also if there is drought, it's the same concept. A rainy day or a period of drought, you have to overcome that. So then it would be good that you have some reserves in your company. So you could, even if their um, yeah, orders are a little bit drying up, eh, or they, uh, the circumstances don't allow you to work as you should to keep developing and also getting uh, income that you're able to overcome. But also in a personal manner. For example, even employees, it's good to have a fund if you get unemployed that you can manage until you get a new employment again. So the concept is quite universally adaptable, but especially for the entrepreneur this is of uh, big importance and why? It depends on where you live, but very often they have uh, regulations, support, etc. for those that are employed. But very often they don't have any, or if there are, they, those regulations and uh, support uh, measurements are very limited if you're an entrepreneur. Because they think you, if you take all the risk, you can have a higher return, but also if something goes amiss, you have to take care of it yourself. Also why, for example, in the Netherlands, entrepreneurs very often don't have a pension, because as an entrepreneur it's not, um, yeah, not regulated that you must build a pension. And very often it's hard as it is to um, make ends meet that a pension is not uh, getting the attention and they put all the attention in surviving the here and now and that's, that's something to take into consideration so especially because a pension gives you a little bit more time to work on it but there is a flip side of course eh? if you don't work on your pension in an early uh, state it will be quite hard to make it in the long run but if you are not even able to survive in the short run eh, during the rainy day as it is now raining or a period of drought then you will be in even bigger trouble because yeah, your existence will uh, persist and also if you have a family that's depending on you this will be even harder that said both the pension and the rainy day can be solved 
to a degree by uh, the fire principles, which um, helps you build up additional passive income streams. And those passive income streams can supplement a little bit your income. And once they can meet your minimal needs, you're independent. Also, also as an entrepreneur, of course, you will be scraping by, but then you can still survive also a period of frauds or a rainy day on those funds alone. So those funds can be there to, to take in away, but in the fire movement, those funds should be able to give returns, passive returns, which help you to get some income, even if all the other income streams have uh, dried up. So that's a, quite a good way to uh, meet both needs. Of course, it can also go wrong. Huh? Your investments that uh, should be uh, passive are just uh, yeah, completely destroyed, or something else happens, market collapses, and those investments uh, are also not paying up, and you will lose everything. That could be the drawback, of course. But there's also a little bit of entrepreneurial life. Huh? It's high risk and sometimes high reward. And also, if you look at those uh, things in the, the pension area, so, for example, if they start to add up to 10% and then you can work a little bit uh, your way up, once they reach 100% of your uh, cost, you could uh, retire. Uh, you could say, okay, I'm just scraping by, but I could retire. And of course, normally also for retirement, you need a little bit more because you don't know what kind of uh, circumstances do occur, but perhaps you can work a little bit to also work for those uh, circumstances, uh, if needed, or, or better still, because you can also become ill, have a little bit more so that you can uh, always scrape by, but also can uh, pay for example medical bills or something else. Have a great day.